Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Hi, nice Hello. <laughs> My name's Emily, and I'm a family learning producer here at the National Army Museum. Welcome to our World of War Horse event, where we'll be hearing from both Sir Michael Papergo and Tom Grahosey Cole as we discuss the new illustrated edition of War Horse. At the outbreak of the First World War, the army needed thousands of civilian horses to serve alongside its soldiers. Riding horses were used in the cavalry and as officers' mounts. Shah horses were switched from pulling buses and ponies. I'm sort of frozen off from you and Tom. Oh, wagons, good. And small but strong horses and ponies carried shells and ammunition. By 1917, the army had employed over 368,000 horses on the Western Front. Michael Mapago's War Horse, first published in 1982, tells the story of these horses. Albert Narricot is a country boy who forms a special bond with a horse called Joey, who he trains to work on his family farm. When Joey is sold to an officer heading to war, Albert joins up in the hope of finding him again. War Horse has since become an award-winning stage play and full-length feature film, and 2020 marks the release of this brand new illustrated edition for children. Our illustrator, Tom Glahosey Cole, grew up in Brighton before moving to London. For the last nine years, he's been transporting people to other worlds, times and places through his truly wonderful illustrations. His works include The Wall, a children's view of life behind the Berlin Wall, Destination Space, a journey through the solar system, which was shortlisted for the 2017 Blue Peter Prize, and The Red Prince, a tale of escape and adventure. Can you give us a wave, Tom? <laughs> yes. Hi, everyone. Tom worked for one and a half years pitching and designing the illustrations to help bring the story of Joey and Albert to life. And we'll discover more about that later on in our event. Michael Mapago is one of the most successful and loved children's writers here in the UK and a name I'm sure we are all familiar with. After his own stint in the army, Michael became a primary school teacher and it was during this time that he began to write. With his wife, Claire, he set up Farms for City Children, a charity that gives urban children the chance to live and work on a country farm for a week. Animals are featured in many of Michael's books, such as The Butterfly Lion, Shadow, A Story of a Sniffer Dog in Afghanistan, and The Amazing Story of Adolphus Tips. Can you give us a wave, Michael? <laughs> I'm sure throughout the last few months, we've all become used to the wonderful, but sometimes frustrating world of technology. So if you experience any technical difficulties, please do refresh your button at the top of the screen. If we have any issues here at our end, I ask please do bear with us because we'll be working as quickly as possible to get those sorted. And don't forget, if we have any budding illustrators or writers in our audience today, you can ask questions using the ask a question box at the bottom of the screen. And we'll try to get through as many as we can. If you'd like to support the National Army Museum or keen to get another gift ticked off your Christmas shopping list, why not purchase your own copy of War Horse by clicking on the green box at the bottom of the screen. It's a great way to support the museum during these difficult times. So without further ado, please can you put your hands together and give us a warm virtual welcome for Michael Mapergo and Tom Glahosey Cole. So, Thanks, to help us set the scene, Michael, could you please tell us a bit about what inspired you to write War Horse? Yes, I can. <clears throat> I moved down here, where I'm speaking to you from, middle of Devon, middle of nowhere, down a little lane, um, and there's farms all around, very few people, lots of sheep, lots of cows, and we moved here for a purpose. We moved to set up farms for city children, which you've already mentioned, in order to invite children from cities, London, Birmingham, Bristol, Manchester, Portsmouth, wherever, to come with their schools, 35, 40 at a time, with their teachers, to live for a week on the farm and work on the farm, to extend their horizons. That was the idea. I was a teacher and I thought this, and Claire particularly, thought this would be wonderful for them. And we've been doing that for the last 45 years, over which now, I think, a time, 100,000 children have been to the farms. We have three farms, one here in Devon, one in Wales and one in Gloucestershire. Anyway, that's why we came here. So it was an accident to come here in the first place to start this project. I came to this tiny village, Iddersley it's called, which has about 80 people living in it and the farms all around. Um, most of the people that, uh, when we first moved here in the uh, 1970s were farming people. Okay. They're very friendly, very well people. And I had discovered that there were three old men, and we're talking now way back in the 70s, three old men who lived in the village who had been to the First World War. 
I didn't know them very well, but one day I walked into the pub. We have a fantastic pub in the village called the Duke of York, which you must come and visit because it's wonderful. And I walked into the pub and one of these old men called Wilf Ellis was sitting by the fire. I went and got myself a drink and sat down and we just started chatting. And all I said to him was, Wilf, I, I heard you were one of the three men in the village who were at the First World War. He said, yep. Yeah. He said, I was there when I was 17 and I was there with horses. I said, horses is cavalry, cavalry, Devon Yeomanry. And then for some reason or other, and I do not know why, he just started talking. I hardly knew this man. He did stop talking for about an hour and a half. I don't know how many drinks later, but for an hour and a half, he went on talking. I went to see his wife afterwards and uh, talked about it. And he said, you know, she's never talked to anyone about this, not even me. So I have no idea why this man opened up. And he told me so much about how it was to be 17 and living in the trenches and living with the fear, the longing for home, the horror of it. And then he said something which really opened my eyes and my heart. He said, I had lots of pals, but I only had one friend. And that was horse. I used to go to the horse at night to feed them, make sure they were comfortable, not too cold. And I put my hand on the neck of the horse and we talk. And he said that. He said, we talk. He didn't say, I talk. He said, we talk. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I tell that horse everything I couldn't tell my pals. I can't talk about, I couldn't talk about how frightened I was, how much I wanted to go. And we were all like that, you know, but I could talk to the horse. And then he said something which really, really made me think. He said, do you know, he said, that horse listened, really listened. And he wasn't some silly old fool. This was someone who was saying something he meant. Um, and so I thought, well, this is interesting because lots of people have written stories and poems about the First World War. And they're usually from one side, from the British side, the American side, the French side, the German side, the Belgian side, from all the sides you can think of, people have written stories about the First World War. But until that point, I didn't know anyone who'd written about all the sides in the First World War. And I thought if you had a horse as a neutral witness, if you like, somehow in the middle of that conflict, then the horse would have an, a horse's eye view of the war from the British side, when it was a British cavalry horse, from the Germans, when it was an ambulance for the Germans, living on a French farm, and you'd have these different, these different views of war. And of course, what you learn from that is that war is not just a matter of them and us, of the enemy and our side. Everyone suffers in wars, everyone. It's universal suffering. And I wanted to write a war which was about, actually not about war, it was about our longing, all of us, for peace. That's finally what it's about. That's why in, in War Horse, there's a meeting in the middle between a German soldier and a British soldier. It's a meeting in the middle. It's this notion of shaking hands. And this horse was what brought these two sides together. So that's why I wrote, uh, that's where it comes from. It comes from the fields around me where I'm speaking. So the spirit of Joey lives on here. So with that in mind, thinking about several, like several of your books have featured um, children, animals during sort of times of conflict. And I know, Tom, you've also illustrated books that kind of feature times of conflict. And do you find that challenging to depict war in a way that's suitable for children? And do you think it's important that children should learn about war? I think uh, it's very, sorry, Tom, you're talking to uh, Tom, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's really important. Uh, for children to learn about war and for us to not forget um, about what happened. I think uh, we're very lucky here to, or at the moment, and for me particularly growing up, we haven't been in a conflict, but uh, that's not to say there's not conflicts around the world. And I think learning about war and learning about history helps uh, us have empathy for other people's situations. So I think it's really important, definitely. Yeah. I think so too, Tom. I think um, yeah. the trouble the trouble is if, if we're not careful very often, you can write books with young people in mind. And um, how shall I say, you can wrap the world up in a, a pink ribbon and make it all happily ever after. And I think when children are very young, that's fine because a child wants to go to sleep with a good feeling and a, the, the feeling that it is a safe world. However, however, really quite soon now, much earlier than when I was young, children know and learn that the world is a complex place. It's a difficult place. And for a lot of people, it's a place where there's a lot of suffering and some of that comes through war. 
And so I think it, it's important for the people involved in writing for children never to patronize them. You have to tell the world as you see it. Well, I'm slightly older than Tom. I don't like to say how many years older, slightly older. And also in my 77 years, we've never had a war, a world war, come to our country. That, I had that just before I was born. All the generation before me, my mum, my dad, all those people, they lived through it. Some of them died. Um, but from my birth, from 1943 onwards, although the war was still going on, I had no memory of it at all, but I did grow up in a world where there had been war and I played in bomb sites and there were soldiers sitting outside sweet shops and with one leg, you kind of saw the effects of war on buildings, on people, and on families. Almost every family had lost someone or known some sort of suffering, or they'd had to leave their homes or whatever. It, it was everywhere. And um, so what did you learn? You learned that actually this was a terrible, terrible thing, war. And um, to avoid it, absolutely avoid it. It's, and it's also a mad thing, a notion that we can't go on talking to each other because we have different ways of believing and different um, you know, sense of our own nation. We, we, we have to go on understanding other people. And that's what the big lesson is from war. And it is that you have to make peace. That's the truth of it. Very much so. So I think, Tom, would you like to share with us a bit more about the process of illustrating War Horse, um, picture book and kind of how it came about and some of the things you discovered on the way? Yeah, of course. Yeah. What I'm going to do is actually uh, share my screen because I've made a little presentation. So I'll just do that with you guys now. Um, but I just wanted to say, hi, my name's Tom Clahosi Cole, and I uh, had the pleasure of illustrating Michael's uh, amazing book. And I know so many of you know and love it. So I, I really hope I've done it justice. Um, so I thought I'd explain to start with just uh, what is an illustrator? Uh, an illustrator is somebody that draws pictures uh, for a living. And for me, that kind of comes in the form of mainly book covers, um, children's books, newspaper articles, sometimes posters, um, advertising, and then I do bits and bobs of animation. Um, but my favorite kind of work is doing picture books. And that's, that's because you get much more creative freedom and a lot more time. Uh, a lot of illustration work is kind of typically very quick, uh, especially newspaper jobs. They have to be turned around in two days or sometimes even one day. Uh, and that really gets your heart going. Um, so a picture book, you have a lot more time to plan and think, uh, try different things. And for me, that means often uh, drawing things from scratch rather than drawing directly into the computer. Uh, so I'm all about, all about picture books. Uh, and my process uh, is a bit of a funny one and it's evolved over years. Always starts in a sketchbook. So I kind of get through quite a few of these because I'm quite quick in the sketchbook and I use traditional materials like pencil and ink uh, and basically just do little loose sketches of, of composition. So say for Warhorse, I was doing loads of tiny little, little loose sketches and most of them are rubbish, but every now and then you'll find a little gem in there. Uh, and that's the one that I'll put a little red tick by, uh, take a photograph of it or scan it in. Um, and then I have these big folders on my computer of hundreds of things I've scanned in over the years. Uh, that, that are really useful because they kind of give your work a little bit of a kind of continuity. I'll use similar textures across all my jobs, but also there'll be things that I draw uh, originally for each job. Um, but it's great having a big folder that you can go in and go like, okay, planes that I've drawn and then Spitfires and da -da -da, or ink and smoke and stuff like that. So then, uh, I add all the color on the computer uh, and I work on an iPad or a Wacom Cintiq, which is just basically like a massive iPad. Uh, and most of my work, uh, especially for Warhorse, was done on the Cintiq, but the iPad is an amazing bit of technology and it allowed me to go and see my parents, uh, travel on the train and uh, color in a horse on the way home. <laughs> so that's a, that's a real winner. 
uh, and it allows you to change things easily and speed things up. So we did a lot of back and forth um, on, on any job, but especially on Warhorse, we, we changed lots of things. So working digitally allows you that flexibility. Uh, so illustrating Warhorse, I thought I'd just tell you a little bit about how it, how it kind of came around. It all started with a, a pitch uh, and a pitch for an illustrator is a lot like a job interview. Um, you, in a different way, you draw pictures rather than go into your interview. Uh, and for, for this one, I was so keen. I was such a, a big fan of Michael's uh, and of the story that I was, I was super eager and super nervous to, to win this job. So I was doing a lot of, uh, a lot of test illustrations and so on. Uh, and these got sent to Michael and the publishers. Um, so these are some of the pitch images that I was drawing. Um, and I guess Michael, you and the publishers looked at some of the other illustrators and looked at them all and then you choose somebody that you like to work with. Uh, That's the way it was, Tom, absolutely. We saw yeah. your early drawings and, and uh, liked them a lot. So um, that, 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 was, that was a good notion of yours yeah. and ours together. Yeah, oh, thanks. Um, yeah, I was, I was absolutely thrilled to win the job and I got to meet Michael in person, uh, which was fantastic. Uh, so my big worry going into this project uh, was, I, was how to draw a horse. Uh, I knew famously that the horse was the hardest thing uh, that any illustrator could tackle. So I was, uh, I was a little bit intimidated and my first drawing of a horse wasn't particularly good. Um, so that, that was the, the first thing I felt like I needed to address. So initially I, I booked myself onto a, an online course on how to draw horses uh, by a guy called Aaron Blaze, who was a famous Disney uh, character designer and looked at everything that it takes to make up a horse. So looking at the skull, uh, the head and how the muscles work. Horses have huge uh, cheek muscles so that they can chew all the grass and uh, looking at all the muscles in the body. And this was a really helpful way to start to kind of get an understanding of the horse and, and the legs and the feet and how they work. And then putting them all together uh, to create a complete horse. And I still obviously find horses very difficult, but uh, this was a really good grounding. Um, but in War Horse, it's not just a horse standing straight. Often uh, Joey is, is galloping through no man's land or leaping over a trench. Um, he's never quite static. So uh, that, again, adds another layer of complexity to the horses. Um, so we started with image research and the National Army Museum has some fantastic uh, images of World War I cavalry units. Um, yeah, some really amazing images from the collection. Tom, Tom and Michael, was yeah. there anything you found surprising or unusual when you sort of started researching this kind of topic? Um, sort of Michael, when you were writing the book and Tom, when you were illustrating, was there any images that really like surprised you or just like really stayed in your mind? Um, well, for me, um, there were pictures of sales of uh, horses from the farms around here in Devon and where, where I'm in the village, in the village green, there was a sale of farm horses um, because the, the army was looking for horses. They didn't have enough. They never had enough. They had to bring in thousands upon thousands from America, um, from the farms in America because they just weren't enough. They needed them to pull the, to pull the um, artillery, to, for, for cavalry, to pull ambulances, for transport. They just needed horses, horses, horses and there simply weren't enough. And so there was a sale in the village and I remember seeing a photograph of a sale like that. Um, it wasn't actually in my village, but it was a similar sort of photograph of the army coming to a small village and the farmers bringing their horses to be sold. So that was in a way a very important picture to come across because it happened here, it happened on the village and in, in my village. And it was a way, I suppose, of believing in the story. And when you're writing a book in the first place, you have to believe in it. And it's quite interesting hearing Tom talk about how difficult it is to draw a horse. He should try to get a horse to write a book. 
which is what I did. I mean, in my in my story, it, it's a horse that tells the story. And yeah. the problem with it is it's absurd. Um, and you have to, while you're writing it, get past that and believe in it, absolutely believe in the story and believe in the possibility that this creature is intelligent and sentient, not so that Joey could write a book, of course not, but so that we know that he does have sensitivity. I mean, if we know anything about horses, and I do because I have a wife who loves horses and a daughter who loves horses, and I've been around horses on the farm quite a lot, they are sensitive creatures. You make a noise, they jump. They feel pain, just like we do. They like love and reassurance, just like we do. They have a lot, a lot in common with us. Do they sit down and write books? No. But the point is, you only got to make that leap of imagination. And the wonderful thing about young people is that once you've done that and offered them the opportunity of, if you like, reading a, a book written by a horse, and they suspend their disbelief much more quickly than grown-ups do, who would tend to sneer at that and say, well, come on, come on, horses don't write books, don't be ridiculous. But children are sort of brighter than that, really. And they say, well, you know, why, why are you saying that? Why, why shouldn't it be possible for horses to feel the same kind of things, not exactly the same. They don't use words, but they shout when they want to shout. Um, you hear a, a horse scream in pain, it's much like we scream in pain. And when you hear they're happy, they have a little a way of talking, of nickering, which is, you know, you know that they're happy and they're feeling, um, and they grunt contentedly when they're eating, which is of course of what we shouldn't do, but we do do. It's very interesting how close you can get to how it is to be a horse. Um, so all those things were part of my research, finding out about horses and finding out, of course, about the First World War and horses, how horses were used. And at the bottom of the story is the research I found out, which was at the Army Museum and the Imperial War Museum, where I discovered how many horses went. And finally, um, I discovered that roughly, we don't know exactly, but roughly a million horses, a million horses went from this, these shores across to the First World War, either in France or Belgium or across to what was Palestine in those days there. Um, all over the world, these horses were taken. Everyone needed horses. And of course, you must remember, and I must remember, that the French army did the same thing, the Belgian army did the same thing, the Russian army did the same thing, the American army did the same thing. So there were, we reckon, 10 million or so horses involved in the First World War. And, but we do know how many came back. Apparently 60,000 came back to these shores out of the million, 60,000. And if you work that out in terms of numbers, it's quite interesting because it is reckoned, no one really has counted it up accurately, but roughly the same number of horses from this country died as the men who died. Yeah. So we're talking 800, 900,000 sort of thing. Um, which is a terrible, it's a terrible tragedy and you multiply that up and that's 10 million horses in the First World War. Um, the suffering is interesting because it's equal. You know, we took them, they didn't, no, they didn't put up their hands and join up because they were for the Germans or for the British, they were taken along. They didn't have any choice about it. And um, it was extraordinary, the friendships that were made between these, uh, between the men and the horses and the fact that they were suffering together and living through it. Um, was was they, they, they felt a very great kinship with horses, I think, the men. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I've put it on too much, Tom. No, no, not at all. <laughs> no, no, I was just going to mention, uh, there's a, a picture that always stays with me that's, uh, it's a horse being kind of loaded onto a boat in the First World War, but the horse is kind of being winched on a crane, and it's kind of just uh, fascinating and kind of scary just seeing how they were almost like cargo uh, brought onto the ships, but yeah. All right, so a few more of the pictures. And uh, They Shall Not Grow Old was a film that I watched uh, right at the start of this project. Um, and that really, it really gave me a sense of place um, and kind of a really good idea of what people were wearing and how No Man's Land looked. That was a really good uh, resource starting off. Um, and also towards the end of the project, uh, just there was a moment in 1917 I saw uh, where the, the shell holes in No Man's Land were so much bigger than I'd drawn in my illustrations. So I went back and was like, wow, okay. I'd, I'd drawn very kind of like neat, small little puddles on No Man's Land. Uh, so that kind of made me think, actually, I think this was much bigger than, much bigger than that. Um, 
so starting off with character design is always a good always a good place to to begin so i would do hundreds of little sketches of uh of all the characters so joey um looking at kind of going more traditional to more character and i much preferred the more traditional uh route but i kind of do hundreds of these for each character and it's just a really good uh, way of kind of getting a few things out of your system and trying trying different things and identifying a few things that work uh, some for, for Joey's dad uh, Captain Nichols and, and Joey's mum and then once kind of you've got a few that are working a bit better uh, drawing them up as uh, full people with full bodies and uh, their outfits and then this uh, this sheet would kind of uh, become almost like a guide for me uh, making the book. I'd always refer back to it and think, okay, uh, uh, that's how tall Joey is, or that's how tall his dad is, and that's what they're wearing, and, and so on. So that's uh, often a, a crucial place to start for me. And then um, also starting with the rough drawing. So I was given Michael's incredible text, um, and then there were lots of big blank spaces for my illustrations, which was quite intimidating. I was, uh, I was like, oh no, how do I, how do I start? But I think the best way to do it is just to start really loose and really rough, um, sketching out lots of really quick ideas, uh, because there will be a few that shine through and and you can take uh, take forward. So taking them forward for me means uh, taking them onto the computer and uh, redrawing them a lot neater, basically. Uh, and then, so these roughs become a guide for, for the color artwork. Uh, this is kind of a selection of, of roughs that I did. Uh, and they're, they're quite a clear, I try and get them as accurate as possible to, to work from the color so that the, the color process is, is almost a coloring in of, of the rough. So, an example of rough to color. This is a black and white rough that I've done. Um, and then that's it with the color. So you can see it really comes to life at this stage. Uh, and this is my favorite part of the process. It's usually when I can put a good audio book on and uh, sit there for you know a couple of days and just play around with colors and, and things. And so I really, I really love this, this part of the process. Um, so for both Tom and for Michael, so I imagine like when you're immersed in the writing process, the characters become such a big part of your everyday life. Um, how do you know when to stop writing and finish a story? And for Tom, how do you know when a picture is finished? Is there always the temptation to add more and more as you're going through kind of going from rough to colour? Can I start? Because I'm yeah. older. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I I just I talk about the writing, of course. Um, the the answer is I tend to um, write very quickly um, after having had months and months of researching it and reading around it and uh, uh, and dreaming it. I call it my dream time, and sometimes this can last for, for weeks or months or even years. And with Warhorse, certainly for a year, I just read all the First World War poems again that I'd read when I was young. I read accounts of the First World War from as many sides as I could. I read a lot about horses going to the First World War, so that I immersed myself in the whole thing. And then when it came to the writing, I was ready to write. My once upon a time moment came and you just sit down and you do it and you have to think, well, that's it, I'm doing it now. Um, and then I don't have a point at which uh, there's a sort of satisfactory end to the day. I tend to try and write anything between 1,000 and 2,000 words a day. This is simply to keep it's like going for a long walk. You just have to keep going and keep going and keep going uh, and then come back to it the next day. And as for when it's finished, if the story is one that really works, it seems to take control of me. That's the fascinating thing about writing. At a certain moment, I didn't know when I began this story how, how it would end at all. I knew there would be a boy and a horse. I knew the horse would be sold away from the farm. And then I didn't know. I really did not know what was going to happen. I knew, of course, it was going to join the British cavalry because Devon is in Britain, and that was a logic. But from then on, how the horse went across to uh, France, how Joey got uh, captured, um, I hadn't had in my mind at all to write about the, 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 the people over whose land 
and it was being fought, the French and the Belgians in this particular case. Uh, that simply happened. And I didn't know how it was going to end. I knew it had to end with a connection of a German soldier and a British soldier in the middle. That was very important. Why? Because that really did happen. It happened in, Christ in Christmas 1914. It's a very well-known story that at Christmas time, the uh, Tommies and the uh, Fritz soldiers decided, actually, we're going to stop fighting for a day. We're going to get up out of our trenches and we're going to get out into the middle and we're going to shake hands and we're going to play a game of football and we're going to drink schnapps and whiskey and we're going to exchange hat hats and we're going to play football. And they did play football. And guess what? The Germans won. Do you know that? 2-1 they won. <laughs> and it wasn't even on penalties. So, I mean, you've got this extraordinary meeting of, and what you really felt is if they had social media in those days, the war would have stopped that evening. Because they, what did they find? The Tommies found that these German guys were kind of like them. They just wanted to go home. They were fed up with being cold. They didn't want to either kill or be killed particularly. And the other side, one side found out the same as the other side. Mm. And it would, I'm afraid it was arranged that the next year at Christmas time, it was forbidden to fraternize, to meet with the enemy because both sides were worried that the soldiers would take over and say, excuse me, we don't want to do this anymore, mm. which is what should have happened, of course, but we know that now. So I don't know what was going to happen at the end. I hope there would be an ending where horse would meet boy and boy would meet horse. I didn't know how this was going to happen. I did want to have an ending which is uplifting. I don't, I never like myself, stories that ended simply in a dark place. And I think for the young people in particular, they have to know that even after such a terrible thing as a war or as a pandemic, let's mention the word, um, there is hope. There is hope for better times. There is hope for a healing. And um, otherwise, I think it's probably not a subject you should go to with young people. You have to give young people hope and a determination that the, there is good out there. There is a lot that you can do to make the world a better place. So that was roughly where I was thinking I was going to end, but I didn't really know. I was feeling my way towards it. Oh, and for, for me, uh, well, finishing a drawing, um, I, can, I can skip to this one now, I guess, uh, is like uh, generally quite a kind of formulaic process. I'll do, I'll fill in all the colors and then it's the lighting and the shadows that generally finish it but I'll often add a an adjustment layer play with the colors and something will just click and uh when it it's kind of clicked and I'm suddenly happy with it that's I'll just stop um and send it off and uh cross my fingers I hope mm -hmm. everyone likes it but yeah um, and how do you kind of strike that balance between it being a story you have a storytelling element but it needs to be historically accurate I imagine it's quite a fine line to get it right kind of in the middle would you say yeah definitely um in fact this image is quite a good example because uh in the rough um I'd drawn it this way but trenches were never actually this wide uh they were kind of always much tighter in much closer so uh in, or, in uh, order to make it more historically accurate, we changed them to be much closer. And I think it's it's a really good it's a really good quality check on your work to do that kind of thing. And have I was lucky to have an expert from uh, the Imperial War Museum uh, who would point me in the right directions if things were off. But especially for a book like this, I think it, everything needs to be spot on and accurate. Um, so yeah, it's it's a good challenge. One thing, Tom, that you did in this book, which was, I thought, very interesting, is that, by and large, the soldiers look young. Um, mm. And I know this book is, I mean, it's, been, it's been put together deliberately so that the story um, is the kind of, um, it's, a, it's in a kind of pack of uh, illustration and story, which is um, accessible for younger readers, mm. six, seven, eight, nine, which, who I've seen coming to the play of it and to the film of it. Um, and it, it, it looks as if you've drawn them too young. That's what I thought when I first saw them. I thought, hang on, these people look too, they look like kids. Yeah. And then you think, actually, I was in the battlefields not that long ago. Mm. And I walked past the grave of a 15 year old 
British soldier. Yeah, yeah. And you know, there were millions of them on both yeah. sides who were little more than slightly grown up children. And I, and um, you know, with innocence written all over them, who we were just put in this horrible situation. So it, it seemed to me to be work out very, very well uh, that it was a young man's war. It, 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 I mean, I'm afraid the awful thing is that it's old people who send young men to wars. That's how it's always been. And it was certainly yeah. so in the First World War. Yeah, definitely. Uh, especially watching the, uh, that film, They Shall Not Grow Old. There were so many young teenagers in, in that. that it, and, and a lot of them talking, a lot of the old men talking about how they cheated the system or said they were 18, but they weren't 18. Yeah, um, yeah. 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 Um, just one more rough to colour. This, this rough, I added a little bit of colour into it. Um, just to kind of give a sense of atmosphere. Um, sometimes it's quite quite good to do that to kind of help sell it in. And then this is the the finished artwork from that one. And it's uh, we had a the original plan was to to kind of have the text up the top left and have some smoke coming across, but that didn't really work. So I did a little bit of forestry, cut down a few trees here, allowed a little bit of light in for the text, um, and. And yeah, I feel like that one worked quite well. So now for an extract um, read by Michael. We're going to have a look at kind of the text and the illustrations together. So when you're ready, Michael. Yes, of course. Well, I'm going to start reading at the point of the story. Um, for those of you who don't know it, uh, Joey um, is sold off the farm in Devon, off this farm, um, to the army up in the village and the uh, British army and was taken away um, a against Albert's wishes, because Albert and Joey loved each other and had grown up with each other. And Albert's daddy did this without telling him and it was awful for him. Uh, and so he goes off and he looks for Joey, he joins the army and goes off to look for, for Joey. But Joey, of course, is now in France um, and the first cavalry charge of the war, he's captured by the German side and he's used to pull an ambulance and uh, all this sort of thing. And he's looked after, he gets lucky after a while, he gets looked after by a wonderful, German soldier, kind man called Friedrich. And this is the moment at which um, Friedrich and, and he are almost escaping from the battle. Uh, and it's a sad moment because uh, Joey has a really good friend, another horse called Topthorn, who he's come to France with and they're really good pals, these two horses. So you have Friedrich and you have Topthorn and you have Joey, these are the three people in this piece. Three people, three characters. One day, they were resting in a wood. Friedrich was sitting down under a tree, singing, whilst the two horses drank from the stream. The shelling came quite suddenly. The whole wood seemed to be exploding around them. There were fires everywhere. The horses tried to run, but Topthorn lost his footing and fell. Joey waited beside him, but Topthorn didn't get up. Friedrich tried to help him, but Topthorn lay still, not moving, not breathing. Friedrich saw there was nothing more he could do. And he tried to pull Joey away, but Joey would not leave his old friend's side. The shelling went on and all around them. Too late, Friedrich tried to run. He fell and lay still. Joey stayed there for hours. Monsters they were, and they were rumbling over the stream, coming straight towards him. Terrified, Joey ran, ran and ran. As darkness fell around him, he galloped through the fields and farmyards through ruined villages. He stumbled into craters, tripped into barbed wire and jumped trenches. He had no idea where he was going. He was just running, running for his life. On and on he went until his legs hurt him so much that he could run no more. Albert was half asleep on sentry duty in his trench when he saw something moving in no man's land. He raised the alarm. Soon the trenches were full of soldiers, helmets on, rifles at the ready, expecting an attack. Albert's sergeant was beside him. What is it? He asked Albert. What do you see? I think it's a horse, Sarge. There's a horse out there in no man's land. There was laughing all around from his pals. One of them said, Albert's always seeing horses, Sarge. It'll be his Joey. He never stops looking for him. And they all laughed again. But then they heard excited voices from the German trenches opposite. Ein Pferd! Ein Pferd! That means horse. 
Someone called out, they seen it too. And another voice, a white flag, don't shoot. One of them's climbing about the trenches. He's going to fetch the horse. Albert knew already in his heart of hearts that the horse had to be his joey. And before anyone could stop him, he was up and out of the trench, clambering through the barbed wire and walking out into the mud of no man's land towards the horse and the German soldier with a flight with a white flag who was already close by. Albert had to be quite sure. He put his thumbs to his lips and blew. But his lips were too cold and dry. He tried again. This time it worked. He hooted like an owl, just as he had always done when he was calling Joey back home. The horse lifted his head, looked up at him, and then he was on his feet and neighing. Albert was close enough now to recognize the white cross on his forehead. The two soldiers met in the middle of no man's land, the horse between them. This is my Joey, my horse from home, said Albert. Do you speak English? Of course. I learned it in my school, the soldier replied. And I have to say that as I was here the first, he is my horse. Well, what are we going to do, said Albert. We don't want to start a war, do we? The German laughed. I think we have all had quite enough of war, don't you? He said, I have an idea. He fished in his pocket and took out a coin. We will toss for him. You mean heads or tails, said Albert. Joey came closer and rested his head on Albert's shoulder. Albert put his arm around his neck and Joey nickered softly into his ear. He knew that win or lose, Joey would have no choice. All right, Albert said. You toss, I'll call. The German soldier tossed. Albert called out, heads! And I'm stopping there. Thank you for that, Michael. That was, that was amazing. Um, so I thought I'd just mention a few things about um, making the cover. So doing a cover for a book, you always start with, again, lots of roughs, lots of small little sketches, uh, trying a lot of different things out. Um, but the important things are that the title reads, reads very clearly and that you can see uh, something about what the book is about. So we were really keen to show Joey and Albert on the cover. And we went with this one, which I was really chuffed with. I um, was really pleased with this image. And I just wanted to kind of say that uh, when you make a cover image as an illustrator, you don't just make the, the front cover, but you make the back cover and the side panels. Uh, so as an image, it's, it's much, much wider than, uh, than you, you would naturally think. And also just the design consideration, it really needs to read very well small because often um, books are viewed online on say the Waterstones foils or Amazon website. Um, so that's one thing that I always try and consider is can I read the, the, the front page very, very small? Can I read the title and can I see what it's about? So from start to finish, uh, War Horse took me uh, one and a half years. Uh, and that was a little bit longer than normally, but it was uh, such a meaty book. And it was probably, I think it was definitely my longest ever picture book that I've worked on. Uh, so, and Drawing Horses took a little bit of, bit of learning to start with. Um, so some of the hardest parts, capturing the emotion. Um, War Horse is a, a story full of emotion, uh, full of friendship and, and love, but also suffering and loss. And uh, capturing that in an illustration is, is always going to be a challenge, um, but it's definitely something that I, I really enjoyed. I kind of feel like my comfort zone is naturally doing like landscapes and scenery, but I, I really enjoyed the challenge of trying to, trying to capture some of that feeling in, in the illustrations. Um, illustrating the realities of war. Uh, it's always difficult um, finding a, a balance in an illustration, 
especially for something like war, you, you don't want to shy away from, you know, the horrors, but also it, it has to be kind of suitable for the whole family. So that was a real challenge, but I kind of also weirdly quite enjoy those, those kind of tasks. Drawing horses, as you know, uh, always difficult, but um, yeah, enjoyable. I, I think I'm almost there now. And then uh, what the horses wear, so their bridle and their saddle, uh, I naturally would always draw Joey, even when he was, he was in his battle scenes uh, and at war with the farm horse uh, bridle and saddle, but we had uh, some experts from the British Horse Society to help me. Uh, identify when the saddle and bridle should change, which was uh, something that I'd never even really thought about before taking on this book. Also getting the uniforms correct. Uh, obviously there's two different armies in two different uniforms. And then within those armies, you have different ranks of soldiers, officers, cavalry units. So uh, that's another thing that I completely hadn't thought about when, uh, when starting the illustrations, I'd just draw all the British soldiers in one uniform and all the um, German soldiers in, in another, but uh, making those distinctions was really important. And having some help from the Imperial War Museum, we had an expert who uh, would point me in the right direction, which was super helpful, especially with things like uh, how a trench is made, uh, how barbed wire was, was laid out and the types of tanks and guns and so on. So uh, yeah, uh, special, uh, special thanks to Michael. Thanks for having me on the book. And, and it was a, a real pleasure. Um, and I thought we'd just do some drawing exercises and get a bit warmed up. Yeah, uh, so if you've you got time to grab a pencil and paper, please do. But remember that you can catch up on this Crowdcast later. It lives online. So you can always come back and pause and try this again later on. But I'm going to be willing subject and try Tom's um, drawings. <laughs> 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 and Michael, you're welcome to uh, try as well. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm going to back away simply because I'm, I know I can't draw. But if I draw, draw a football, it looks like a rugby ball. If I draw a rugby ball, it looks like a football. My sort of drawing, I don't know if you can see this, um, uh, but I'm sort of pointing it at you. This is the kind of drawing I do. It's called writing. Um, <laughs> and it's, it, that's, what a, that's what Warhorse looked like before it became a book. So I'm going to leave the drawing uh, to, to you people um, but I, and, and see, see how well you do. And um, Tom, Tom, I have to say, the atmosphere you were given to this um, book is, is extraordinary. It's had many guises, this book. It um, was a wonderful play by the National Theatre with wonderful designs of uh, puppetry and Ray Smith did an awful lot of wonderful drawings for that and for another version of the book. And then there was the film um, and um, now there's this, it's a, it's a new and different, and I love it because it's Thanks. shining a new light on the same story. And it also made me think again about the story because I wrote it way, way back in around 1980. And I, I, I like it all right, but there are one or two things I didn't like. I got a chance in this book to retell it just in 3000 words. It's much, much shorter to leave room for your wonderful pictures. Um, and I discovered that there were things I could put right. So I made it a better book. So thank you very much for that, Tom. Oh, no, thank you, Michael. <laughs> Cheers. It was, a, it was a real treat for me. Um, yeah. So, uh, so these drawing exercises, I was thinking, this is one thing that I always do to get warmed up. Um, and it's just to, to kind of stay very loose. I do little 20 second drawings. Um, and this is also a game that me and my family play at Christmas. So I'm get, something's going to flash up on the screen and I'm going to start the stopwatch and uh, I'll give you the five, four, three, two, one, the stop. And then uh, Emily, you can kindly show oh, us no yours. La no laughing or heckling, please. No, no, um, no, no they're, they're not supposed to be good. They're just supposed to be a great way to, to kind of get loose. Um, so the first one, if everyone's ready, so three, two, one.
and that's five, four, three, two, one, stop. How'd you get on? Um, slightly deformed, perhaps. Oh, wow, that's very good. That's brilliant. <laughs> that's fantastic. Definitely got uh, drunk, so that's the main thing, moment, isn't it? You've got a lot in there. You really did. Did you do one, Tom? I didn't, sorry, I was timing, um, but may, I, uh, I don't have a pen on me, actually. No, but... oh, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. We'll rely on Emily now. <laughs> yeah, I'll play in straighter for a little bit. Okay, so the next one. Three, two, one. No, I like an octopus. Yeah, I watched uh, My Octopus Teacher on Netflix, oh. which was fantastic. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very intelligent. Did you know that? Yeah, oh, incredibly intelligent. Unbelievable. Will you please make sure there are eight, Emily? I'm counting, I'm counting. Oh, oh. Can. <laughs> uh, that's it. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Oh, wow. Some, some legs are slightly longer than the others. Oh, They're brilliant. Very I good. would have oh, just gone. Emily, hold it up again. I didn't see it. Yeah, brilliant. He's a, bright, he's a bright octopus. Look at those eyes. Very sensitive, <laughs> very perceptive eyes. A great intellectual octopus. Oh, yeah. Mine tends to look more like spiders. Um, so the next one. Three, two, one. And five, four, three, two, one, stop. How'd you get on? So I've tried to do it half submerged. Oh, no, it's good. In the water. <laughs> That's brilliant. Yeah. And the tail. It looks, that, uh, I have to say, it looks a slightly surprised crocodile. Yes, perhaps a little bit. <laughs> and very scary teeth. Very That's scary. very quick thinking to, to submerge him halfway. That's brilliant. <laughs> um, I think there's just two more, so uh, I'll count I'll be you in. Out of my misery soon. <laughs> uh, three, two, one. Not bad. One of my faves. No, it's difficult, Emily. It's very difficult. You get a lot of these uh, around the South Downs. And we get a lot of them in Devon too. The problem about bats, of course, is that you um, can't hear them. You may not be able to see Emily's drawing either. It'll just have flashed past. <laughs> Stop. Let's have a look. Whoa. Oh, that's really good. That's brilliant. Oh, okay. It's a bit bird-like. No, that's, that's, that's all right. Wonderful. That's great. Nice. Okay, the last one. I warn you, it's a hard one. Okay, three, two, one. Oh, oh no. The big challenge. I have a good friend who's an artist. Whenever he draws a horse, he puts a bush right in the middle because he doesn't like drawing the middle bit. <laughs> the middle but bit. The horse is always yeah. hiding behind a bush. <laughs> okay, two, one, stop. Well, I must admit, I've had a little bit of help with this one because I have seen Tom's tutorial on how to draw a horse. Oh. So oh, that, that, is really good. Good. that is great. Very good. That's hair as well. I listened earlier when we were practicing and Tom was showing me how to do it. <laughs> nice. Um, it would be great to see some others if people send them in. Yeah, but, um, if you've had a go at home, please do send them in. You can share them with us on our social media or email them in if you want to. Be great. Great. Wonderful. Now, I was just, um, just recorded a, a really simple uh, tutorial about how to draw a horse's head and how to draw a soldier. Um, these might run a little bit quick, so if you do want to watch them again, uh, I think that they're, they're available, aren't they? So, how to draw a horse. This is how I this is how I learnt first. So I always start with a wedge shape, and then I do a kind of triangle at the end for the nose, and then. From there, it's an upside down triangle. And then from that top corner, you can draw an ear from there. And then it's a backwards six. 
which I really enjoyed learning uh, for the nose. And then just that I pop in a line for now for the mouth and a dot for the eye. And then the cheek, which is one of the horse's biggest features. It's a big U. And then a big curve from, from the ear downwards and almost a straighter line from the cheek. And then you can add any kind of hairstyle you want. Um, I've just gone for flat, but you could you could have hair in the wind or however, but the hair runs back down the side of the, the neck. And then just a little bit of detailing, um, indicating the edge of the muzzle and giving him another ear um, and just showing the inside of the ear. And that's, that's my simple horse. Great, very good. Thanks. Um, you can go more complicated, but I thought it's, it's good to get the structure in. So uh, this is how to draw a, a simple soldier. So if you lightly draw a circle and draw a cross in it, this is how I begin any character, um, the circle and then the jaw. Uh, and I knock that back. You could do that in pencil um, and then use that as a guide. So you can plot your eyes on the line and then plot your nose just around the bottom of the line and the mouth somewhere in the, in the last, in the lower piece. Add some ears and you can draw the jawline in and add some eyebrows. And then I add the, a ring around the top for the hat and a half a circle for the top of the helmet. And then any hairstyle you like. Um, for Albert, I kind of gave him a little bit of hair peeking out the front. And then the hair goes all the way along. And then you can add some little lines in for helmet straps. Sometimes soldiers didn't wear them. Sometimes they did. Um, some details, some little tees in the ear and then adding in the neck. And this is where we go into the clothing. So I always start with the collar um, and the collars on um, World War I uniforms were quite big. So I, I like to keep them quite big. Um, Add, a, add in the shoulders and just the edge of the arms, a bit of material, a little seam there. Um, a big old button. And then I, I like to put a little strap um, there for the gun, indicate the pocket. So the soldiers often had loads of pockets on their uniforms, so it's good to, good to get one of those in. Um, and then you can just, I, add in a gun and add in the lines on the straps. And then you can add in a, a few little details if you like. Uh, I often would add in a little bit of mud or some dents on the helmet. Um, some, you could add some tears to the clothing, uh, but that's essentially it, some little shoulder straps. And that's, uh, that's my, my simple soldier. Uh, and you can watch that back if it helps. Thank you hey. very much for that, Tom. That's um, all right. Such a good insight into everything you've been doing and as well to hear a bit about Michael's process. But we have had, we've got some very excited people in the audience today with lots of interesting questions. So Evie would like to know, um, hello, Michael, I'm hoping to be an author. What would be your best advice? And also, Tom, would you be able to tell us your advice? If anyone got any budding illustrators out there, what would you say is the best thing to help them get into that kind of career? Oh, have we lost Michael? I think uh, we might have done. Oh, oh come back. He's coming back. Oh, yeah. I will ask the question again. So I've got a question for you, Michael, and it's from Evie. And she says that she's hoping to be an author and she'd like to know what your best advice is. Um, Evie, the best thing to start with is to live an interesting life. That's really important. Go places, meet people, write a tiny bit each day, just notes, two or three lines each day so that it becomes as natural for you to write as it is to speak. And then one of those things that you write down each day, maybe a snatch of conversation, it may be something that you've seen, something that makes you cry or makes you laugh, it's there in your notes. And it can be the beginning, like this little seed of a story. And then the thing to do is not just for me anyway, 
is not just to write immediately, but to do this dream time, think it out, think it out, go for long walks, and start weaving in other things that you've seen. And before you know it, you've got something you really care about, and that's really important. You have to care about what you write. It has to be important to you. And then there comes a moment when you've sort of got it together, you know the people, you know the place, and you're beginning to paint the picture of the story in your head. Don't postpone it for too long. At some point, sit down, and you do your equivalent of once upon a time, and off you go. And then listen, tell it down onto the page. Whatever you do, try to forget that you're writing it. Don't worry about the spelling. Don't worry about whether it's tidy. You just tell it down through your finger and your pen or whatever it is, your computer, but tell it down. And then after a page or two, read it out aloud. And you'll think, hang on, this is quite good. And then you'll go on. That's what I do. And that's what I do every day. So all I can do is tell but I, if it helps you, that'd be great. Don't get too good. There are far too many good writers out there competing with me. So don't get too good too quickly. <laughs> <laughs> what would your advice be to any budding illustrators that we might have in the audience? Uh, I, I'd just say a similar thing, just practicing every day um, and just drawing things that are around you. Um, I, I find that observing things in real life is a really great way to start. And there's so many interesting things you can draw around you. Uh, I love going outside, taking a sketchbook out there, uh, drawing some trees or drawing your local park. That's one thing in lockdown that I've done. I've gone to Crystal Palace Park almost every day and done a little drawing um, just because there's nowhere else to go. But there's still so many fascinating things to draw there. Uh, so, yeah, I just say keep practicing. And that's kind of the only real way to, to keep going. You know, you get better. I think, better. I think what there Tom's very important the business of looking um, mm. looking hard and, and, and listening and as you're doing it feel it not to rush past it's one thing this pandemic has taught us is that we've got time to stand and stare Definitely. And so if you see if you see a blackbird don't just sort of walk past and think it's a bird watch yeah. it listen to it and um, if it sings to you sing back it's that kind of thing that you you can do so we're in agreement we're in agreement about this yeah definitely could I just ask my, is, I heard the other day, somebody said there was no such thing as writer's block. Is that, is that true? Um, well, clearly some people think there is. I think it's, it's entirely personal. I, I learned from a very great writer, uh, Ted Hughes once, because I got stuck on a book. In fact, it was called War Horse. I got stuck about halfway through it. Yeah. And um, I, I said, I don't, I don't know where I'm going to go with it. And I got stuck. And he said something quite firm. He mm. said, well, um, maybe you shouldn't have started it when you did, that you started it too soon. Did you dream about it long enough? And that's always been really good advice, mm -hmm. is that you must be really ready to write it down. You know, you must have it in your head. So much of the people and the place should be in your head. Mm -hmm. um, not that you know everything, but it must be rich, rich. There's a whole lot of stuff you want to get down there. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you won't get writer's block. And then I think the only way to come out of writer's block is to go on writing mm -hmm. and make mistakes. And making mistakes doesn't matter. You've got a, in my case, you've got a pen. You can cross out lines and just go on. But whatever, whatever you do, don't give up. The other thing he told me is that if you do begin a book, always finish it. Because if you don't finish it, the next one, you will have less confidence even in starting it. So finish what you've written and be happy with it. Work on it. If you don't want to do anything with it, put it in a drawer and put it down to practice and then get on with the next one. And don't worry about getting published when you're, too young don't worry about that stuff the great thing is to start storytelling or writing your poems and then when you're ready yes send it off to someone but write as if and i think he taught me this really you write as if you are talking to your best friend you're confiding something that you really care about and you want to pass on thank you for that one michael i've got a few more questions from our lovely audience so somebody has asked tom did you look at the work of the war artists at all um when you were doing your research and also have either you visited flanders and the trenches um and did that kind of influence um writing and illustrating this book at all mm. uh yeah i i have visited but it was years and years ago um so i <laughs> so not for this project unfortunately but I have a very vivid memory of um, all the trenches being uh, covered in grass um, yeah and then I did look at uh, quite a few of the war artists I just can't um, 
pick a name out of my head right now but I I definitely looked at quite a few I've got a book called Vitamin D um, which is about drawing and there's a war artist in there who does these big charcoal sketches of um, of battle scenes and, and they were fantastic and also uh, something that was really good was um, you know like little models of like planes and warships and so on often on the front cover of the box of that model there'll be an amazing painting uh, from the 1940s or 50s or so on of a, of a war scene or a battle scene. Um, but they were really kind of inspiring and informative. They're great colours, uh, really kind of retro like feel, but they were really good. There's a wonderful um, war artist who I sort of grew up with, a man called Paul Nash. Yeah. And in fact, one, one or two of the as the, the landscapes of no man's land of, uh, that you have done, uh, Tom, um, reminded me of, of them. And, and he went there and he lived there with the soldiers and he painted and he came back and was very passionate about to finish this war because you could see what it was, what it was doing to people. And yes, I've been a lot to Ypres. Um, I wrote another book called Private Peaceful about the um, First World War, and I did my research in the museum there, which is called In Flanders Field. And at one point, we had a wonderful thing. We took Joey, um, the, the huge life-size puppet from the play of Warhorse, um, and we took Joey to the Menin Gate in Ypres um, uh, at a certain moment, and that was rather wonderful. So I go, I, I've been there quite a lot. I have a lot of friends there now. Mm. Wonderful. A few people have asked us um, kind of as to why the illustrated edition has a slightly different story. Would you be able to <laughs> shed some light on that for us, Michael? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the original book is about, I don't know, I never counted the words, but I think it's about a thousand words. So I, I was, I gave myself, a, a, well, the publisher said, would you like to do a shortened version of it? <clears throat> and I did. I rather like that idea of taking something and having another look at it. And I knew it had be short, <coughs> 3,000 words. So I thought, well, uh, yes, I'll try it. But if you do that, you necessarily have to leave things out. And once you start leaving things out, um, it has a consequence to the rest of the story. Um, and uh, you, you might have noticed, even in the piece that I read, it is not the same as in the book. In the book, um, Albert meets Joey again and uh, in a veterinary hospital for horses behind the lines where he's working. And in this story, Albert is in the trenches and sees he's the one who climbs out of no man's land and meets him in the middle. And I rather like that. So if I write, if I wrote War Horse again, the big book, the 40,000 word book, um, then I probably have Albert teaching him in no man. But I have to say that whenever anyone takes something of yours, a story of yours, whether it's a film or a play, they change it. it it's bound to happen. So, for instance, if you go to the wonderful National Theatre play of War Horse, where you've got these amazing, amazing puppets, it was very, very clear to start with that they were going to have to change one particular thing. In the book, there is an auction at the beginning when the little Joey is, as a foal, is sold away from his mother to the farm and first meets Albert. And in the book also, there's an auction at the end, which is when they auctioned off, and this is horrible, they auctioned off many of the horses that had survived the First World War, it was the end of the war, and they were auctioning them off to whoever wanted to buy them. And many people who wanted to buy them were French and Belgian butchers. So many of them were killed at the end of the war, even if they weren't killed in battle, so to speak. That's what was in the book, because it's right in history, that's what happened. And at the National Theatre, they thought, and quite rightly, you can't have an auction at the beginning and an auction at the end. It sort of wouldn't work. And then when Spielberg made his film of War Horse, he changed the German. I had this German Friedrich. I was very fond of him. He was a central character to the story. The, the German really that um, looks after and sees him through a really, really hard time um, and is a, is a wonderful character. And I think um, the people who were writing the script thought, no, we've got to have more of a story. And so they had two Germans, two um, brothers, and they were looking after each other. And it's a story really of how they took Joey and Topthorne and they were going to escape back home. And anyway, they did very badly. But so people do that, they change it and that's fine. I, I, don't, I don't mind that one bit. It's again, like Tom doing this book, it's a new light shone on the story. 
definitely. I'm afraid that's kind of all we have time for today. So I'd like to say a huge thank you to everyone at home watching and also to you, Tom and you, Michael, for a truly wonderful insight into the world of Warhorse. Um, just to add that this event was brought to you free of charge today. So if you're watching at home, don't forget that you can click through and purchase a copy of the lovely illustrated Warhorse edition here and show support for the National Army Museum. So thank you once again, another round of applause for our lovely speakers. And I hope to see you all in the museum sometime soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Thank, thank you, Emily. Thank, thank you, Army thank Museum. Thank you, all of you.